I'm Christian. I write code. It's probably all you need to know. Um, <laughs> mostly, uh, uh, mostly in uh, upstream kernel. Uh, I maintain a bunch of users-based stuff. And uh, I've talked about this once before, I think, so far, at uh, LPC at least. Um, this is some work that we did over the last couple of kernel releases, four kernel releases to be exact, uh, with a bunch more stuff hopefully, uh, hopefully coming. So, um, And this morning started really great because I poured coffee o over my laptop. So you're all happy that my laptop is, is still working. <laughs> uh, I hope this isn't a, a, good, a bad sign for the talk. Um, so who has heard of Pit of Ds? So far, a ah, bunch of people have, a uh, bunch of people have uh, read LWN, I assume. Um, so let's jump right into this. Uh, so what is it? What's a pit of D, and uh, why did we do this? Um, I thought I'd start with a little justification for this because I think it has been a wild ride so far. Uh, the idea is that it's uh, just a file descriptor referring to a process, and specifically NFD that is referring to a thread group leader. So right now we don't, we didn't have the ability to uh, refer to a single thread. Uh, there is no real technical reason, well there is par partial technical reason for it. We, we could do it, but then things become way more complicated and no one really had a use case for this so far. But in the future, if for example, GLIPC wanted to decide they want to do threat management with it or p-threat management with it, they, we could probably do the work and extend this. But so far it's a threat group leader. Um, and I'm going to, uh, going to go into the history briefly, like all other op operating systems have similar concepts. Um, so this isn't a completely novel idea. Um, and it's a stable private handle. So the, F the FD, the file descriptor, uh, guarantees the reference to the same process, which pits don't, they're not a stable private reference. Um, and it uses a pre-existing uh, stable process handle that we already have in the kernel, which is uh, struct pit, which you see on the, on the right. And it's not uh, task struct. So, because we could have done both, right? We could have done either task struct or we could have done struct pid. Um, and the reason why we didn't use task struct is, anybody has a guess? Just the sheer size. I mean, the, the reason, if you, look into, if you look into the kernel code and you look for the reason why struct pid actually exists, it is so that struct task, uh, task struct doesn't need to be pinned all of the time. So you have a lot of task structs uh, in the kernel. It wastes a lot of memory. It's, it's a pretty huge struct. Um, and struct pid is an abstraction on top of it that it's used. It's the kernel's internal version of uh, what a uh, like stable reference to a process. Um, you have a bunch of uh, interesting members in there. I think the most interesting one is struct uh, hlist head tasks pit type max, uh, which means uh, which you can be, which can be dereferenced with RCU, um, and you can get to any task struct that is used as a specific pit type uh, for this specific process. Which means, so for example. Um, a process can belong to a session ID, right, to a process group. Uh, it can be a thread group leader or it cannot be a thread group leader. Um, and sometimes you want to go from um, what is the thread group leader, what is the session group leader, what is the process group leader, and this you can do with the pit type uh, max uh, field right here. So it gives you a link to all of the task structs that are associated with this process. Um, and which will become more interesting in a little bit is wait q hat t wait pit of d. Um, so right, that's the general uh, idea. Oh, and by the way, if you have questions, you can just go right away. Uh, so why did we do this in, in the first place? Um, the very obvious reason uh, that a lot of people have talked about, I guess, is pit recycling. To avoid the pitfalls, pitfalls of pit recycling, um, especially on high pressure systems. Uh, so why does pit recycling occur? Because we have cyclic pit allocation in the kernel. So alloc pit, Basically, you set a limit on a maximum number of pit, and when that limit is reached, it just wraps around and grabs the next free pit, which you can see means that you can easily recycle pit, so you can trick the kernel into recycling pits for you. There are a bunch of CVEs uh, associated with this. You can, can technically avoid or at least make uh, the timing of pit recycling very unlikely by setting a very high pit max value. Uh, which I think System D nowadays uh, is doing, but it's still timing-based security, and as Jan put it, he doesn't like it, <laughs> which I agree. Um, we also could have done it, probably gotten around this problem in a bunch of other ways, not, not a bunch, but um, at least one other way, uh, instead of doing PIDFDs, and we'll get to that in a little bit. 
So the CVEs are actually interesting. Um, there is one on, there are a bunch on, uh, on Android uh, where getBitcon, which is a SE Linux security function, I think, um, has been tricked into operating on the wrong PID. There are interesting PID-based Mac exploits, which I didn't know about, that also have to do with PID recycling because they don't have PIDFDs. Uh, and there are a bunch more for Qt, for OpenSSL, um, and yeah, there is another one, interesting one from Project Zero at the top, which I don't remember right now, but it is also related to pit recycling. Oh yeah, that's the Polkit bug. Um, Polkit had a pit recycling bug where it could be tricked into authenticating you even though you weren't the process that they wanted to authenticate. So this is a real issue because people come up, ah, does pit recycling really happen? Yeah, it does. And uh, another reason why we did this, so that, uh, do we have users? Uh, which I show in a little bit, uh, shared libraries. Uh, shared libraries that want to spawn invisible helper processes, which is a pretty uh, big problem. Well, it's not a, well, it's a, for some uh, generic shared libraries in user space, it's actually a pretty big problem. So let's assume you have a main loop running, and uh, this main loop has a bunch of callbacks, and you have a, uh, one of those callbacks is a generic handler that waits on children uh, when it receives a sick child signal. Now, you don't know what's running in your main loop. You might spawn off other helper processes, right? Uh, um, not spawn off. Someone in your main loop might fork off uh, separate helper processes, which you are not supposed to reap. That, and you don't know about these processes. So, but you get a sick child signal. So now you call your generic weight handler, weight ID minus one, weight ID PR, whatever it is, uh, and you suddenly reap that child. Now, someone else in the main loop wakes up and is like, where the hell is my child? And it's gone. So sick child handling kind of makes this uh, makes this more difficult. There are tricks you can get around this by explicitly ignoring sick child and not caring about the exit status of the child and so on. But it's it's pretty tricky. And there is a good blog post I think by Tiago who is uh, uh, goes into a little more detail about uh, generic issues with installing um, uh, signal handlers in threads safely. Uh, Tiago is the cute maintainer, or one of the cute maintainers. Um, and process management delegation. So uh, what we ideally would want, be, want to be able to do is handle, uh, hand off a handle to a non-parent process for waiting or signaling and have that be safe without being afraid that uh, pit recycling and so on is happening. Uh, use cases for this, obviously, uh, low memory killer management uh, daemon for Android who does this in uh, user space um, and manages other processes. Systemd, uh, obviously, is another example. Uh, and you can't do this correctly right now or securely. Um, and why did we choose PIDFDs? Uh, my main argument was, first of all, it has been done before uh, and it worked quite well. So there are users of this interface on other operating systems. Um, FDs are ubiquitous, which means everybody uh, or most programs in user space, some have code to deal with FDs, right? I mean, they have an epoll loop. They usually have some way to parse out FD info. They have ways to send around FDs. So there's not a lot of, you know, it's very easy to adapt to this new interface. Um, an alternative would have been, which people I think also brought up, brought up, I don't know if it was just on IRC or also on a mailing list, is why not UUIDs? Why can't we get UUIDs? Well, huh? Yes, exactly. Uh, that's also what I said. Um, but some people still want it, uh, but now we have a good argument. We can just say, go away, build it in user space on top of pit of these, if you want that. Um, so yeah, the, the, the fact that there is a common pattern that already exists everywhere in user space uh, makes, them, makes them pretty nice, actually, I think. Um, and does user space really care about this feature? So usually, uh, this is a common joke I always make. If I can just code write, uh, write code for myself for my own entertainment, great. Uh, but it's up, probably not a good argument uh, to bring to the kernel mailing list, right? I, you know, this is a nifty feature I, I found interesting to work on, but nobody in user space actually cares. Uh, but user space actually does care. Um, some of these projects were nice enough to write mails and say, hey, we've been using this interface, this helped us out a lot, um, and some of them I just found on the way. Um, so Dbus is thinking about adding a new authentication method that is not based on PITs anymore, but on PIT of these. Um, Cute. Uh, who also pushed for pit of these a while back. I get to that in a second. Um, they have a pull request up. They were just waiting for 5.4 um, to come out, or are waiting for 5.4 to come out, because they're going to have the, the whole pit of the API um, in one shot. 
Um, system D, uh, right now there is just an issue up about using PIDFDs to reliably kill all processes in the C group, but the idea is that at some point they'll switch to process management, uh, switch to PIDFDs uh, for process management um, completely, which is pretty good, I think, um, whether or not you like system D. Um, CRIU, checkpoint restore in user space. Um, they restore process trees, and they need to make sure that the PID that they're operating on, so for example, they do a sequential um, checkpointing of a PID, of a process, right? And so in between two checkpoints, uh, the process could have been restarted and recycled. So what they do, they have a function is called detect PID reuse, which does all kinds of proc magic to find out whether this is still the same PID, um, and they want to switch to PIDFDs, so they can get rid of this function. Um, Android, um, Joel is here, um, exactly. Uh, he has also helped a, a bunch with this work. Um, I'll come to that in a bit. They're using it for the low memory managed killer daemon. Um, BPF trace recently uh, had, has an issue, open an issue about switching to PIDFDs uh, when the system supports it. And Rust has like a generic or someone, Mio is like a low level performance library for, IO performance library for Rust. They are uh, switching to PIDFDs as well. So there is some, some stuff going on uh, in user space, which is great. Uh, made it also easier to justify why we're doing this work. And Pryad, I think this is important to mention, like uh, this obviously has all been my idea and I'm absolutely brilliant. But uh, no, it's, it's not how it goes. We, uh, we took inspiration from um, uh, other operating systems, or I tried to take inspiration from other operating systems. Though, I made a very classic mistake. I started looking at the actual implementations in other operating systems after we got parts of what we did merged, which is obviously very smart. Um, so it's KQ EPO all over again. Um, Illumos, I thought, had uh, stable process handles. Uh, but actually, uh, they don't. They just have a pure user space emulation of a stable process handle, which uh, I found out by looking at the code. Proc open, proc run, proc close, proc free, but it's all the same. It's the same problem. Um, OpenBSD and NetBSD don't have it. Um, uh, FreeBSD has it. Uh, so this is, this is prior art. Um, they have a concept called ProcDesk. Uh, which is probably a process file descriptor, and they have three separate syscall, which is PD fork, um, PD get pit, and uh, PD kill. They've done things a little bit differently than we did, and we can go into this in a little more detail if you have questions about this. They, you know, process management overall is the same as in Linux, but there are special cases where they do things differently than we did. Like, for example, what happens if you mark a child as being auto reaped? They do this differently than we do. Um, and Linux had uh, a bunch of, I think, I don't know how many, but people tried to push for this before. There was Fork FD, which was a, a syscall that was proposed. And a while back, we had, I think in 2015, we had um, Clone FD. And uh, this, they actually didn't land. Uh, and I tried to make sense of why they didn't land, because people already back in the day wanted, uh, wanted this sort of feature. Um, I think one of the reasons is that, uh, especially the clone FD patch set, tried to do a lot of things at once. Um, so it mixed auto reaping, new auto reaping semantics for processes with uh, getting a pit of D um, and a bunch of other stuff. So ultimately, it, it didn't land, I think, because there were too many features baked uh, into it at once. Um, something which uh, we didn't do, so we did it sequentially over kernel releases, which has uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, I can talk about this in a little bit. So uh, we started uh, building a new API over four kernel releases, um, and we split it into individual, uh, small individual elements. Uh, one of the reasons, because I said before, uh, is related to the clone FD patch set. I didn't want to come up with like a really big patch set and then just try to push for it and get all of this functionality in at once. That would have probably never happened. It would have taken a long time. People already had massive, like a lot of opinions on the way how we did this. Um, so we, we tried to split it out, which also gave us time uh, to think about the individual bits and pieces of the API. So one of the first things, I you don't see all of the code, but that's fine. Um, so one of the first things we did is sending signals, because this is uh, actually the most obvious example. And so this was very easy to push for on the one hand. So to make the argument, pit of send signal, it allows you to uh, safely send signals to a process. Um, uh, without it being recycled. 
uh, was an easy argument to make, but at the same time, it also meant that people had a lot of opinions, uh, which, is, which is fine. I mean, uh, but the problem is, if you're at, at this time, so I maintained large user space projects before, obviously, uh, and I also maintained bits and pieces in the kernel, uh, and so I had sort of an idea of how to handle people sending you patches and reviewing and so on, but it was kind of challenging to keep the, dis the discussion in one direction, especially if you don't have all yet have the standing as someone who's been working on the kernel for like 10 or 15 years. So focusing the discussion was actually really an interesting challenge. Um, so, and I learned a lot doing this, and PIDFT sent SendSignal definitely was, uh, was uh, the first uh, very difficult patch set to, uh, to pull through, uh, to put through, I think. Um, so there were different, people already tried to reliably send signals by implementing files in PROC, I think. That was one of the solutions. Other people had the idea that we should use IOCTLs. Um, to just solve those specific problems, and I, uh, a specific problem. And what I had in mind uh, and was uh, always have a sort of API built around PIDFDs, not a sort of shortcut hack that would get rid of one single uh, problem, which is sending signals. Um, anyway, this triggered a long discussion, and people had. Now we we got into uh, we got to the point where we had to discuss what exactly is a going a, a PIDFD going to be. Uh, my original idea that I pitched at LPC and at LSS to a bunch of people uh, was we should use uh, anonymous inodes for this because it's just a nice concept um, and we get to this in a little bit. But people really, really wanted to use PROC PID uh, file descriptors to send signals or at least have the bus possibility to use PROC PID file descriptors to send signals. Uh, and so with PID if you send signal at least, you can use file descriptors that you get by opening PROC PID. So they take a dear of D. Um, and uh, so if you know how this works, proc, uh, proc pit directories already stash away a reference to, uh, to struct pit, so it's really easy. It's like basically the concept that we had in mind all along. Um, and so you can do this with pit of descent signal. You can stuff in proc pit file descriptors in there and uh, signal, uh, send signals to them, uh, which solves one of the problems. It's not completely race-free. You need to be able to create pit of these at process creation time uh, for that. Uh, but here we are. So right now we ended up in a situation where we have two file descriptor types, which I don't really like, to be honest, and I would like to have them go away or can like have a config flag to not have proc pit file descriptors be a, uh, be a thing. But it's only for pit of descent signal, and we have precedent in the kernel where we where we will have the same issue. So the new mount API will come with mount of these, right? They will be anonymous inodes. But if you have something like an FS info call that David is currently working on, it needs to work on normal file descriptors from directories and it needs to work on mount file descriptors and it will exhibit different behavior depending on whether you pass in a DRFD for a regular directory or a mount FD that you get from fspick or fsmount because they expose more features. Um, so we have precedence for this. Uh, it's not my ideal solution, uh, but here we are. So PIDFD send signal got in. Uh, that was great. That was the first most obvious bits. Um, and then we did uh, for 5.2 to solve the, the race that you always have, which is at process creation time, you want to be able to create a process file descriptor uh, such that you can be sure that there will be no race. Um, and this patch set wasn't uh, that great either, uh, but it, it triggered an interesting discussion. Um, namely, now we had this proc pit file descriptor thing. The question that we now had to answer is what do we return from clone? Um, and I don't know if you followed the discussion. So uh, people then pushed for, well, clone should probably also now return file descriptors to slash proc slash pid, which turned out uh, is really nasty. It's really difficult to do. So I, I really didn't want to do this, um, and a bunch of other people also disagreed that this was, uh, that was, the, this was the right approach, but at this point, this was what people wanted, so we had to implement it. What we did, uh, so uh, Jan and I have been discussing this for a, for a while and how we would go about doing this, and so we wrote an RFC. Uh, one RFC and the second RFC. One RFC uh, which returned prop pit file descriptors from uh, clone, and the other one which returned uh, anonymous inodes. And it turned out uh, the code that you had to write uh, without going into security uh, to return proc pit file descriptors was really nasty. You had to pre-allocate, because the way proc works, you had to pre-allocate a dentry and then splice it in later. 
it was it was really nasty code and also uh, proc wasn't there was a discussion about proc directories not being safe because you can get into the net directory which means you can spoof on or sorry you can uh, uh, spoof on another process uh, networking information, for example. So it really also wasn't safe, or it wasn't clear uh, it, would be, it would be safe. So we probably also would have to rework ProcFS, which we probably sh still should do, uh, but um, I'm glad it didn't end up this way. So we showed this code, and then people said, okay, the code is, the anonymous inode code is way simpler, let's go with this. Um, and this is what you get. So this, it's really not a lot of code. Um, yeah. Yep. Now it's not too much. Oh no, actually the way you just described is something that I find is becoming a big trend in the kernel. And actually I don't think it's really a bad idea. Um, it also gets rid of a lot of the bike shedding arguments where when you start having an argument, you're just telling people like, I don't like the way this is doing. Uh, I just had to do this with Linus just the other day, which, or which is implement it their way, like you said, and implement the way you like, want to, and show them side by side. And actually, this is a good, another good example of saying how to get what you want in the kernel. Show them the what, how, what it would look like what they want alongside with what you want. And then when they look side right. by side, they're like, oh, I get it now. So, great example. Well, yeah, the funny, is, funny thing is, you know who pushed for the proc bit directories being returned from clone? Who? Linus. Of course. <laughs> uh, and uh, Al, uh, Al was saying, this is, this is we, sh we shouldn't do it this way, and a, bu uh, a bunch of others as well, and uh, we wanted to have the, uh, an inode approach, and so it really helped that we had code to show that yeah. this is just so complicated, uh, which is, and it's going to be hard to maintain in the future. It's going to even be more, be more difficult to build features on top of it, so I'm really gl gl glad we uh, did it this way. And yeah, it, it's a strategy uh, that worked, I think. It might be a strategy Linus is pushing now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I cost, cost more work. Um, yeah. So this is the, the code that you now find in uh, in Fork, which has changed. Fork has changed over the last couple of kernel releases a bit, at least uh, core process creation code. Clone pit of DSF, you set. Uh, you get an anonymous inode. Uh, you stash away a struct pit um, in there, which I showed at the beginning. Uh, you take a reference on it, um, and then you return a uh, pit of D. Uh, so anonymous inode, I, I don't know how, how many people are in, somewhat familiar with the VFS. I mean, yeah, okay, so that's fine. Um, and uh, there is some, I guess some interesting things to note is uh, pit of Ds are closed on exec by default. Um, first of all, because I think all new file descriptor types that we implement should have uh, closed on exec by default but also because you really don't want to leak uh, unintentionally a file descriptor for a child process into the child itself. Um, you don't want to do that. Um, but also, uh, having file descriptors non-closed uh, on exec for user space is usually a big pain. It's a, it's a complaint we, we regularly get. Um, it's easy to enable directly, uh, directly in the kernel. I tried to push for the same thing for, the new, for all new mount API uh, FDs, but that didn't f uh, people didn't agree and, and now we have like four different clo exec flags I think for the mount API which is also a thing you waste a flag bit uh, if you don't do it this way and you can just strip away the clo exec bit via uh, FCNTL um, and the other thing is we have in proc pit FD FD info you can find out the pit of the process uh, in your procfs pit namespace. <coughs> So if you mount proc in a new pit namespace, um, you're, you will have different pits than you have on the host. Um, and if you get sent a pit of D and you want to know what is my pit, um, because you don't have used clone pit of D, uh, then you can parse FD info and it will show you uh, the pit uh, in your pit namespace. Uh, so the nice thing is we, uh, um, there's, this is where we diverge, for example, from FreeBSD, maybe because they don't have clone, not sure right now. Uh, they do PD fork, and uh, you get a PID of D back. And in order to find out what uh, the PID of uh, the PID is of the process that PID of D refers to, you need to do a second syscall, which is PID get 
pit or something. I, it doesn't matter. You need to do a second assist call. But um, the way we did it, um, and this is really nifty, uh, we have, at least for the legacy clone syscall, um, we abuse a return argument uh, and return a pit of D in the return argument, but also return you to pit so you get both information at the same time, which is pretty, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, which brings me to a, to a point, something that I always like to point out. I never had the idea in mind that PID of these and the PID API are sort of separate, and that you either use the one, you can't use the other one. I think that's not how it will work, at least not for user space. It's sort of a, a, a pick and choose kind of thing. The fact that we have a nice transition or connection between both the PID API and the PID of the API makes it pretty nice. You can choose to totally go only with PID of these, but you can also mix and match uh, at this moment, um, which I quite like, to be honest. And for 5.3, we did the clone 3 syscall, which is not necessarily related, related to, uh, to PID of D. Uh, this is general process management. We did it because we stole the last flag bit, and there was like clone time in S coming up, or clone new time. The time namespace patch said, um, um, so they couldn't have, they wanted to take the same last flag bit that we eventually did, but by that time, clone PID of D had already landed. So now we have clone 3, and clone 3 also has a dedicated return argument for uh, for PID of these. Um, so we're not abusing a return argument in, like we do in classic clone. Uh, but that's just a, uh, an argument on the side. And uh, for 5.3, and this is work that uh, Joel did, uh, and it's pretty important, um, polling support, exit notification for non-parents, which is something that you couldn't really do nicely with the old PID, uh, PID API. Um, so PID of these are pollable, which means uh, in this case, uh, when the process exits, well, to be precise, when the threat group leader exits and the threat group is empty, which is not necessarily the case, can get into situations where you have a dead zombie uh, threat group leader, but live threats, which is problematic because then you can send signals through zombies, so have fun. Um, uh, anyway, when uh, the task exits, um, when the, when the process exits, you get a notification on all uh, PID of these, uh, which is obviously great because you can hand off uh, PID of these, or it's a good idea at least, you can hand off PID of these to non-parent processes and get um, exit notifications. Um, if you're interested, I don't know how much time we still have, I can give you a, a, a short little demo of this. Um, ah. See this? Ledger? Okay. So. One second. Huh? Oh, this is Tmux, but yeah, it's a but it's on a tiling window manager. So uh, I have just really like two simple C files. Uh, um, that send around. So the first one, really gnarly code I hacked up yesterday night after already I had some beers, so you excuse me. Um, it just creates a new uh, a pit of D um, and it opens an abstract Unix socket um, and uh, it waits for someone to connect and then sends, uh, sends the a pit of D over and then wait for the pit of D to exit. And on the other side you have, which is equally simple, uh, Uh, which connects to the abstract Unix socket and then receives CFD and then adds it into poll and waits for the process to exit. So if we do this, we see we created a PID of D. This is 3012. I obviously uh, send it in, send it in, and send it out. Um, and uh, for the process 30584, uh, I raised a signal um, in the child process, which stopped the process. So I raised six up in the uh, in the child, and uh, you see, see on this side right here, is waiting for the pit of D to exit, and so I can just use kill cont and then three o five a four a, uh, and then you get an exit notification on on the pit of D process with pit of D four has exited, so you can hand off pit of Ds and get exit notifications. Um, right. Okay, and uh, what we also did in 5.3, a lot of people had the use case like, mm, 
clone pit of the great idea means that everyone in user space for which we want to have like proper pit of these, which are pollable, uh, would need to create processes going forward with clone pit of D. We can't really rely on that. So is there a way we can get pit of these without clone pit of D? And it was like, yes, we should probably do this. And this is how pit of D open was, uh, was born, which allows you to create a pit of D from a pre-existing process. Uh, it's again, it's really simple. I, I, it's something that I really like about all of this work is like the code that we had to write was really simple. A lot of the infrastructure was already there for sure. I mean, all of DFD and VFS, in general, the VFS layer uh, helped out a lot. Uh, yeah, so that was pretty cool. Um, you pass in a PID, uh, it uh, finds it and gets a reference to the corresponding struct PID, and uh, then checks whether it is a threat group leader. Because right now, as I said, all of this only works with threat group leaders. And if it isn't a threat group leader, it gives you Einball, and otherwise, it creates a PID of D and gives you back a PID of D. Um, so yeah, that's pit of the open. I mean, uh, Android has probably a good use case for this because they want to manage processes that they uh, that they don't control, or whose process, whose creation they don't control. Um, and 5.4. Last time I gave this talk, this was still at Plumbers. This was still proposed. Um, so waiting on pit of these, uh, which is 5.4. That Linus pulled this work. So p pit of D is a new argument to the wait ID this call. And instead of a PID, it now takes a PID of D. Um, and then you can wait uh, You can wait on PID of Ds through the wait ID uh, syscall. This is the core, I would say, the skeleton, the core infrastructure that we build around um, PID of Ds. So you have all the bits and places, in, uh, all the bits and pieces in place such that you can now manage PID of Ds solely, uh, uh, processes solely through uh, uh, PID of Ds, but there is more stuff to come. Last time I gave this presentation, but pe people came up with so many suggestions on what to do, um, on what to do next, or at least uh, copied some of the stuff that FreeBSD uh, did. For example, uh, one thing that uh, people came up with is why can't we have kill on close semantics? So right now, when you create a PID of D uh, and you close it and it's the last reference, uh, nothing happens to your process. It just stays alive. Um, but why not make it so that you could set a flag at process creation time, uh, the kill and close flag. And if the last FD uh, that references that corresponding struct file in the kernel is closed, you get sent a sick kill signal from within the kernel and you kill that process. It goes away which is uh, overall n not a bad idea, but there are some interesting differences between FreeBSD and uh, Linux. So on FreeBSD, once you have called close, and that file descriptor is the last file descriptor referring to that corresponding kernel object, um, then it will immediately be freed, which means at the point when uh, close returns to you, uh, you know that, the, for example, the struct file that has sashed away struct pid is gone. So the process is dead by the time close returns. Um, on Linux, we have, I think, fput mini, which adds it to a work queue, which is not necessarily guaranteed. But by that, I mean by it's not necessarily guaranteed that when you close that file descriptor and the close disk call is returned to you, and it was the last file descriptor referring to struct file, it doesn't mean that the release method for the struct file has been called, which doesn't mean the process is necessarily dead. Now, usually there shouldn't be, a, like it, I asked Tijin about this, I think. Uh, and usually there shouldn't be a, uh, a long difference, uh, a long time between actually the release method being called um, and uh, so and the process being killed. But there could be a delay, especially if you're on memory, on the high memory pressure. But I mean, then you're already screwed anyway. Uh, so this, I've been thinking about this, but I haven't really, and I have a, a POC for this, but I'm not sure uh, I'm happy with the, the the release semantics that I just outlined. Um, and exclusive waiting. I think this is a big piece that is missing. And the semantics for this, uh, I keep mulling over the semantics for this, um, which is at process creation time, I want to say this process uh, referred to by this PID of D can only be waited upon, uh, for example, through uh, PID of Ds. Um, and once that PID of D have gone, is gone and that process exits, uh, it gets uh, auto reaped. And it also means this hides it away from generic wait requests, which means uh, if you know that you're in a program that has a generic event loop and you fork off a helper process, you might want to set clone wait PID because it means you're, you won't appear in the wait ID syscall of any, anyone else, uh, which means you can now fork off invisible helper processes nicely. 
So this is something which we, uh, which we probably want. Again, this is, uh, first of all, uh, finding time to uh, work on this. Second of all, the exact semantics and how to implement this are uh, interesting. So uh, I don't know, auto reaping semantics in the kernel are kind of interesting anyways. Um, and there is obviously a bunch of races going on. So what happens if you close the last pit of D, but the process hasn't yet exited? And you know, it's, there are interesting challenges um, around this. And uh, something a lot of people have brought up was pit of D's and namespaces uh, multiple times. It's like, can't we use pit of D's to somehow pin namespaces, manage, manage namespaces? Uh, that was an idea I had a long time ago, but uh, I'm unsure whether that's ever going to fly. Is you could pass pit of these to the set and as syscall, and then uh, instead of interpreting the flags argument as a type as it is done right now, you could imp uh, interpret it as a flag, and then you could uh, set an as to uh, multiple namespaces at once, something which has been missing. So right now, if you set an as into namespaces, you always need to do it iteratively, right? You need to do open FD, set an as, open FD, set an as, open FD, set an as, which is syscall heavy, and this would allow you to get rid of a bunch of stuff. There is also Right now, for PIDFD send signal, for example, we don't allow you to send. So if you get a PIDFD uh, for a process that lives in a different uh, PID namespace, uh, you can only send signals uh, to that process if it is uh, in your PID namespace or you are an ancestor of the PID namespace. This PIDFD is wrong. So right now, what you can do is send to uh, sibling PID namespaces. Uh, simply, simply, first of all, because I wasn't clear, um, I think Eric was arguing for this, that we should de do this, or there isn't a reason for this. I blocked this because, I'd, first of all, no use case. I don't want this complex semantics in there right now. Second of all, um, I don't know how secure this would be. And also, stuff like that always strikes me as somehow crossing privilege boundaries, especially if you take into account that you pit of these uh, user namespaces are closely tied together, uh, usually. Um, and if that's the case, I want the property at process creation time that tells you, yes, it's fine, you can send signals to, uh, to that process. Whoever has that PID of D can send signals to that process. That's what I would like. So I in essence, if you think about it, right, clone is like open for processes, I I'd say. And uh, what I would really like is if it has, if clone three especially supported sticky uh, sticky cement, uh, sticky properties, which means you give a process a given property at process creation time, and after that you don't, you can't take it away anymore. What we do, what we often do is, at least from what I've observed, is we create a process with a specific property. We do a PR cattle later that allows you to turn off or turn off that property, um, and I think that's not a nice model. What we really want is create something with a given property and then be able to just send it around and whoever has access to the PIDFD can then use that, can use that, uh, can use that ability, which makes it pretty nice and especially important, I think, for process management. This way, a more privileged process can create a PIDFD with uh, a given ability and then hand it off to a less privileged process because, for example, it thinks it's fine. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem. So that's what I really want. But these are just a, a few of the directions. Other people have su suggested something which I don't know if it's crazy or actually brilliant. Um, so um, I think the systemd guys were uh, using, oh, if you receive, sometimes if you receive a message over a socket, you implicitly get sent a PID. Um, and they use this PID usually to get C group information and all that kind of stuff out, which is racy. And so they were asking for a socket option uh, and which lets them explicitly opt in. Instead of getting sent a PID, they would get sent a PID FD. I don't know. Uh, there are a bunch more stuff. Uh, a bunch more stuff that people came up with. So, um, am I out of time? Okay, I am out of time. Okay. Um, that's actually, I like to put this slide up. Uh, lessons learned uh, uh, when we uh, implement, we worked on the PIDFD API. Speed matters. Uh, I really think it matters in the sense that choose a sustainable seed for develop speed for developing features. Uh, this is something I, I sort of learned. I think it depends on totally on your working or review style, but especially if you get into, get into really hairy stuff, like doling out a lot of features one after the other kind of makes it difficult to keep on top of reviews and opinions and so on. You want to make sure that you respond to people who have valid points to raise and so on. Um, uh, a 
The second one is, I think, pretty important is uh, the open up your being dumb. It's okay to say I don't know or I can't review that, um, which uh, helped a lot because then you had people jump in and like, okay, I can help out. Uh, uh, so we had good help from Alec, we had good help from David Howells, from Jan uh, helped out as well uh, in the bunch of discussions and so on. Um, so that was pretty helpful. And uh, resilience, I think. Uh, especially at the beginning when we started this work, things got, I mean, if you want to look it up and want to see um, uh, me first of all looking dumb, and uh, second of all, uh, a discussion spiraling out of control, then you should look at the first patch that's for PIDFD send signal uh, and the discussions around this or PIDFD design in general. And it's like, it's a huge, uh, it's a massive thread that nobody could follow anymore at some point. Um, and, uh, but it was really good that we sort of pushed through and that we saw uh, that the work that we did was actually, uh, I hope, valuable, especially for uh, user space. Uh, and with that, I'm at the end of my talk. And, uh, open to questions. So does it happen often that the maintainers have like opinions and are hard at people? Sorry, what? You're does trolling. You could go on, but I didn't get it. I have bad ears. Does it happen often that the maintainers have that many opinions and are difficult to deal with? No. <laughs> no obviously, yeah. Um, I think being opinionated, uh, being opinionated is very important. Um, you can be, it's, I think you can be nice and say no. Um, that's fine, uh, but actually, it's, Sometimes that also depends, I think, on wh what standing you have in a community, right? I mean, if you are a, if you are a sort of well-known maintainer, this is just my two cents, and there are more people who are experienced and can speak to this, but if you're a well-known maintainer and you tell somebody no, then people, for the most part, uh, unless they're obnoxious, will usually listen to you. Uh, but it doesn't, isn't necessarily the case when you're, when you're a new maintainer, for example, or you work on something that is relatively new, then you, know, you need to tell people no multiple times. Or it's good when you have other people backing you up and telling them, like, yeah, go away, this doesn't make any, uh, this doesn't make any sense. But yeah, opinionated, I think, is sort of absolutely necessary. Otherwise, you, you end up with all kinds of crap. Yeah, so this is more like a technical question. So I don't use PID name spaces, but I was wondering, you mentioned like you can have a process that's in more than one PID name space. Did yeah. You see? Yeah, so how, how does that like work? Like who creates the process ID for like the new name space and how does That's it all baked into the kernel. Like when you do, uh, when you create a process with, for example, clone new PID and S or in general, um, you create it in a nested PID name space without leave out the uh, clone new PID stuff. You create it in a nested PID name space and you have a bunch of ancestor PID name spaces. Then there is a loop in alloc PID uh, which walks through all of the ancestor PID name spaces and also allocates a random PID in, in all of the ancestor PID name spaces. So when the process returns, it will have a process ID in all ancestor PID name spaces. Yeah, and they're a long time. So they are they're properly, it's like, I, apart from user name spaces, PID name spaces are the only namespace that is properly hierarchical. Yeah. Which makes process management really more, uh, more interesting, especially when you think about creating processes with specific properties and signaling across namespaces and so on, which is something that we probably at some point uh, want to do, right? Uh, so, uh, a while back, uh, like yeah, in, on the VPF side, we use VD to like, point to everything, to map the program. And when we started discussing this stuff uh, with systemd guys, they pushed back and proposed a new API to have one FD to cover multiple things. The concern was that 
in their practice, they saw a bunch of applications and packages from the old days that still use select. And select will have a silent memory corruption on any FD that's more than 1000. That's why like systemd had maximum like uh, file descriptor limit to 1000 for the longest time. And it took us, well, long, many, many months to convince systemd to change the default. And now they bumped it, I forgot, to like 4,000. But uh, still the default file descriptor, maximum file descriptor per, per process is still low. So with this, like if PDFD becomes like really everywhere and you'll have so many processes, you will get to the right. uh, per process of G limits very quickly. So uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think so. And the reason is to the following. I think, um, so making use of PDFDs uh, when would you make use of PDFDs? Uh, when you have a process or you have a bunch of processes where you really want to make sure that they are the processes that you want to operate on. But I don't, so in other words, I don't think systemd will, if, even if they start switching to the PDFD API, um, I don't think they will start uh, spawning all processes using FDs. They will have a bunch of high profile processes they are like, these are, for example, demons that, I, that we spawned off that belong to us, and we really want to make sure that the, they, they stay around and we can refer to them uh, via a stable process handle. But for all of the other stuff, they can probably just use PITs because they don't care about, uh, about this that much. Uh, and a bunch of, so a lot of applications that will have really important process for them will use this. So I don't, I don't think it's going to be that big of an issue. Um, I also talked with uh, I talked with the system D guys about this, like about this feature, um, a lot, and this was actually not a concern they brought up. So interesting, but maybe I can uh, ask them and see what they think about it. Yeah. 